Section 1 of 3 Minute Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Mary Maxwell. 3 Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards. Johnny and His Sandbox. Johnny's Sandbox is in the backyard. It is a fine big box with the sides raised so that Johnny and the sand will not fall out. The sand is fine and dry and almost white. It came from the seashore, and sometimes you find a little shell in it. The things that belong in the sandbox, besides Johnny himself, are the blue tin pail to hold sand, and the red tin pail to hold water, and the shovel, and the rake, and the old kitchen spoon. The things that do not belong there, some of them, are the woolly dog, because the sand gets into all his wool and then shakes out onto the nursery floor and Maggie says it is a sight. And Johnny's shoes and stockings, he likes to take them off and sift the hot clean sand between his bare toes. And the neighbor's cats. This story is about the cats. There are five of them. One is black and has a red leather collar with a little silver bell. It belongs to the deaf old lady next door and its name is Jetty. Another is yellow and belongs to the lame girl in the white house with green blinds. Its name is Topaz. The third cat is gray with white front and paws. This is a lady cat and her name is Malta. She belongs to the lady whom Johnny calls Mrs. Nose. Mama does not allow him to say this and he tries to remember but sometimes he forgets. One day he said right out, good morning Mrs. Nose and she only laughed and said her nose was just the right size and she needed it all to smell catnip with. She's a funny lady and Johnny likes her and Malta too. The fourth cat belongs to Mr. Chops the Butcher and is a big tabby with green eyes and fierce whiskers. Johnny doesn't like him at all, but the fifth cat is Muffet, his own dear white kitten. Now all these cats were friends except Bob's the Butcher's cat. He lives on meat, and Mama says perhaps that makes him cross. Anyhow, he is cross, and he growls and snarls and spits at Muffet and Jetty and Topaz and Malta, and tries to steal their fish bones and upsets their milk, and really is a very horrid cat. The story happened one night last week. Johnny was asleep, and Maggie was tidying up the nursery before going to bed, when suddenly she heard a queer noise. It came from the yard, and she stepped to the window and looked out. It was a bright moonlight, and what do you think? The cats were having a party in the sandbox. The four friendly cats, that is, Muffet and Topaz and Malta and Jetty. Maggie thought Muffet must have invited the others, for she was sitting in the middle of the box with her front paws tucked under her, looking so pleased and happy. And the three others had their paws tucked in too, and they were all four talking in soft little mews and seemed to be having a very good time. Then all of a sudden there was a snarl and a yowl, and that hard great bob sprang over the fence and into the sandbox and began clawing and spitting and scratching right and left, just as hard as he could. At first the four friendly cats were too startled to do anything, but in another minute they began to spit and scratch and claw and there were all five of them rolling over and over, scattering the sand on every side and making such a noise that it woke Johnny out of his sound sleep. At first he was frightened, but Maggie told him what it was and said wait and see what she would do. She pushed up the fly screen very softly and then she brought the great big jug full of water and leaning out, splash, she emptied it full on the fighting, struggling cats. Oh, how they yelled. One jumped this way and one jumped that, and the next moment not one was left except poor little Muffet sitting in the middle of the box and crying pitifully. Oh, poor Muffy, said Johnny. Poor Muffy, all wet. So then good Maggie ran down and brought Muffet up and dried her with a towel and comforted her until she purred. Johnny wanted to take her into bed with him, but Maggie said that would never do. So what do you think? She put her in the doll's cradle with Susan Dolly and covered her up and told her to go to sleep, and she did. End of Johnny and the Sandbox Section 2 of Three Minute Stories This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bev Stevens. Three Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards. Monosyllabics. The black cat sat in the fat man's hat. Oh dear, the fat man said, may the great grey bat catch the bad black cat who has left me no hat for my head. The big brown bear tried to curl his hair to go to the fair so gay, but he looked such a fright that his aunt took flight, and he cried till night, they say. A pale pink pig in a large blonde wig danced a wild, wild jig on the lee. But a rude old goat in a sky-blue coat said, You're naught but a shoat, tee-hee. A poor old king sold his gay gold ring for to buy his old wife some cream. But the cat lapped it up with a sip and a sup, and his tears ran down in a stream. A large red cow tried to make a bow, but did not know how, they say, for her legs got mixed and her horns got fixed, and her tail would get in her way. A boy named Sam had a fat pet ram and gave him some jam for his tea, but the fat pet ram tried to butt poor Sam till he had to turn and flee. A girl named Jane had a sad, bad pain in the place where she wore her belt. She mopped and she mowed and she screamed aloud just to show the crowd how she felt. A sad, thin ape bought some wide white tape to trim a new cape for his niece. But a bold buff calf with a loud, rude laugh bit off one whole half for his geese. A pert, proud hen laid an egg, and then said cluck, and cluck, and cluck. Said the cock, had I known you would take that tone, I would have wooed none but a duck. End of Monosyllabics Section 3 of Three Minute Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Katherine Russell, Ohio, USA. Three Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards. The New Leaves. Wake up, said a clear little voice. Tommy woke and sat up in bed. At the foot of the bed stood a boy about his own age, all dressed in white like fresh snow. He had very bright eyes, and he looked straight at Tommy. Who are you? asked Tommy. I am the new year, said the boy. This is my day, and I have brought you your leaves. What leaves? asked Tommy. The new ones, to be sure, said the new year. I hear bad accounts of you from my daddy. Who is your daddy? asked Tommy. The old year, of course, said the boy. He said you asked too many questions, and I see he was right. He says you are greedy, too, and that you sometimes pinch your little sister, and that one day you threw your reader into the fire. Now all this must stop. Oh, must it? said Tommy. He felt frightened and did not know just what to say. The boy nodded. If it does not stop, he said, you will grow worse and worse every year till you grow up into a horrid man. Do you want to be a horrid man? N no, said Tommy. Then you must stop being a horrid boy, said the new year. Take your leaves. And he held out a packet of what looked like copybook leaves all sparkling white like his own clothes. Turn over one of these every day, he said, and soon you will be a good boy instead of a horrid one. Tommy took the leaves and looked at them. On each leaf, a few words were written. 
On one, it said, Help your mother. On another, Don't pull the cat's tail. On another, Don't eat so much. And on still another, Don't fight Billy Jenkins. Oh, cried Tommy. I have to fight Billy Jenkins, he said. Goodbye, said the New Year. I shall come again when I am old to see whether you have been a good boy or a horrid one. Remember, horrid boy makes horrid man. You alone can change the plan. He turned away and opened the window. A cold wind blew in and swept the leaves out of Tommy's hand. Stop, stop, he cried. Tell me. But the new year was gone, and Tommy, staring after him, saw only his mother coming into the room. Dear child, she said, why, the wind is blowing everything about. My leaves, my leaves, cried Tommy, and jumping out of bed, he looked all over the room, but he could not find one. Never mind, said Tommy. I can turn them just the same, and I mean to. I will not grow into a horrid man. And he didn't. End of The New Leaves Recording by Katherine Russell, Ohio, USA Section 4 of Three Minutes Stories This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Damla Ozdemir Three Minutes Stories by Laura E. Richards Grandmother's Alphabet The aunt is so busy it makes her quite dizzy. She says that her head goes whirl around whizzy. The bunny is funny. He cannot make honey, nor write with a pen, nor shoot with a gunny. The cow is not able to sit at the table, and so we must send her to eat in the stable. The duck goes a-quacking and clicking and clacking and eats all she finds from beeswax to blacking. The elephant mighty cannot find his nighty, and makes him feel nervous and fractious and flighty. The fish has no wish to be put in a dish, so he's off like a flash with a swishity swish. The goose has no use for an Indian papoose, so she looks at it sadly and says, what's the use? The hen lays an egg and stands on one leg and says, cat could a cat, observe me, I beg. The ibis is pretty but not very witty. And when he is tired, he plays with the kitty. The jaguar so cruel was killed in a duel, and left his poor wife to eat nothing but gruel. The kind kangaroo has so little to do, that he talks to the mooley and tries to say moo. The lizard goes sighing and sobbing and crying, because his poor tail got shrunk in the dying. The moose is all humpy and grumpy and lumpy, and if you say boo, he is off with a thumpy. The newt has a neighbor who fights with a saber, and when he is conquered he beats on a tabor. The owl and the oyster went off for a royster, and when they came back they were put in a cloister. The pig bought a carrot to give to his parrot, but Paul was so frightened she hid in the garret. The queen in her crown and velvety gown, she went to the circus and laughed at the clown. The ram and the rattlesnake had a great battle, for each called the other a tiddly-tattle. The stork had a fancy to go to a dancy, but people said, No, you are rather too prancy. The timorous taper was reading the paper, and found that his aunt had married a draper. The unicorn tried on a camel to ride, but there came a sad fall to himself and his pride. The viper is vain and cannot explain why people persist so in calling him plain. The woodchuck is wealthy and hearty and healthy, but sometimes his movements are snooping and stealthy. The Xiphias perks his head up to see Xerxes, and thinks him much finer than Tartars or Turkses. The yammering yak has spots on his back. He can't get them off, so he puts on a sack. The zebra, with zeal, was cooking a meal, but he found it was onions and stopped with a squeal. End of Grandmother's Alphabet Recording by Damla Ozdemir Section 5 of Three Minute Stories This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Three Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards The New Leaf Why are you crying, little cat? asked little dog. Because my paws are so cold, said little cat. I have been digging in the snow and I, I cannot find one. One what? asked the little dog. One new leaf. What do you want a new leaf for? I want to turn it over, but there aren't any to turn. Of course there aren't, said little dog. It's winter. But little girl is going to find one, said little cat. I heard her mother say to her, You really must turn over a new leaf. And she said, I truthfully will, Mama. And when little girl says she truthfully will, she always does. Then her mother kissed her and said everybody had to turn over a new leaf now. And she had some of her own to turn, so she knew just how it was. The door shut then, on the tip of my tail, too, and I heard no more. But what do you suppose it means? Little dog shook his head. We must ask somebody, he said. Let me see. Great old dog is out for a walk, and Crosspatch Parrot bit me the last time I asked her a question. I know, said Little Cat. We will ask Old Cat in the barn. She knows a good many things, and if she isn't catching rats, well, but she generally is, she will tell us. They found Old Cat in the barn sitting on a truss of hay, washing herself. She listened to Little Cat's story, and her green eyes twinkled. So you have been looking for new leaves under the snow, she said. Yes, said Little Cat. First I looked on the trees, and there weren't any there, so I thought it must be leaves of plants and things. So I scratched and dug till my poor paws were almost quite frozen, but not one single scrap of leaf could I find. <laughs> said Old Cat in the Barn. This barn is full of them. Full of leaves? Said, cried Little Cat and Little Dog together. What can you mean, Old Cat? We don't call hay leaves. How many rats have you caught this week? Asked Old Cat, turning to Little Dog. None, said Little Dog. The last rat I caught bit me horridly. Besides, they are odious, vulgar beasts, and I don't care to have anything to do with them. Phew, <laughs> said Old Cat. Little Cat, how many mice have you caught in the kitchen this week? Little Cat hung her head. I haven't caught any, she said. I don't care for mice. The flavor is too strong. I like cream better. Phew, <laughs> growl, said Old Cat. Her green eyes shot out sparks, and her fur began to stand up. Now you two listen to me. Why do you think the big people keep you? Because you are soft and pretty and foolish? Not at all. They keep you because you are supposed to be useful. Your mother, Little Cat, was a hard-working, self-respecting mouser. She caught her daily mouse as regularly as she ate her daily bread and milk. Your father, Little Dog hunted rats with me in the barn as long as he had legs to stand upon, and between us we kept this place in tolerable order. Great old dog cannot be expected to hunt at his age, and besides, he's too big. One might as well hunt with an ox. But since your parents died, you two lazy children have been done next to nothing. And what is the consequence? I am worked to skin and bone, and the mice are all over the house. I heard Cook say so. Mind what I say. No creature with four legs or two is worth his salt unless he earns it, in one way or another. Now, what have you have to say for yourselves? Meow, said Little Cat. I am very sorry, Old Cat. Yep, yep, said Little Dog. I am sorry too, Old Cat. Very well, said Old Cat and Barn. Then turn over a new leaf. Meow, yep! That is just what we want to do, said Little Cat and Little Dog together. But we can't find any. The fact is, said Old Cat and the Barn, 
it is one of the foolish ways of speaking that the big people have. It just means stop being bad and begin to be good. Now, do you see? Purr, said Little Cat. Now I see. I will go and catch a mouse this minute, Old Cat. Woof, said Little Dog. I see too, and I will come and hunt rats with you, Old Cat. Purr, said Old Cat in the barn. That is right. Go to work like good children, and as I may have been rather short with you lately, I will turn over a new leaf too, and ask you both to supper with me in my hay parlor. Cook gave me the bones of the Christmas goose, and we will have a great feast. End of The New Leaf Recording by Katrina Yankevichuta Section 6 of 3 Minute Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 3 Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards. Mr. Hoppy Frog. Mr. Hoppy Frog was very, very funny, Mr. Hoppy frog he had not any money so he could not buy a squeaky woolly dog it made him sigh and sob and cry poor mr hoppy frog going down the lane he met with mistress kitty when she saw his pain her heart was filled with pity mr hoppy frog oh do not weep for that to buy a woolly dog i'll sell my sunday hat bowing down before said mr hoppy frog i love you even more than squeaky woolly dog come to church with me and wear your sunday hat and we'll through life be frog and wife sweet mistress kitty cat end of mr hoppy frog recording by iswa in belgium in august 2015《セクション7 of 3 Minute Stories》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Katherine Russell, Ohio, USA.《Three Minute Stories》by Laura E. Richards New Year's Day in the Wood Do I look nice? asked the rabbit. Very nice, said the chipmunk. That is, for a person who has no tail to speak of. But of course you cannot help that. The rabbit looked into the looking glass pond and saw his little white blob of a tail. Don't you want to lend me yours just this once? he asked. I would take great care of it. No, I cannot do that, said the chipmunk. But I can lend you the tail of my late uncle. It is such a fine one that we have kept it to brush out the nest with. The very thing, said the rabbit. So the chipmunk brought the tail of his late uncle and tied it on to the rabbit's stub. How does that look? asked the rabbit. Fine, said the chipmunk. Now tell me how I look. Well enough, said the rabbit. Of course you would look better if you had long ears. Dear me, said the chipmunk, and he too looked into the looking glass pond. Haven't you a spare pair that you could lend me? Why, yes, said the rabbit. There is a pair that belonged to my grandfather, hanging on the wall at home. I will get those. So the rabbit got the ears and tied them on to the chipmunk's head. How do I look now? asked the chipmunk. Splendid, said the rabbit. Now let us go and make our New Year's calls. Where shall we go first? I wish to call on Miss Woodchuck, said the chipmunk. So do I, said the rabbit. We will go there first. And off they went. They came to Miss Woodchuck's door and knocked, and she opened the door. Mercy, she cried. Who are you and what do you want? We are Mr. Rabbit and Mr. Chipmunk, said the two friends, and we have come to make you a New Year's call. More likely you've come to steal the nuts, said the lady angrily. 
I know Mr. Rabbit and Mr. Chipmunk well, and neither of you is either of them. Who ever heard of a long-tailed rabbit or a long-eared squirrel? Get along with you. You are frights and probably thieves as well. And she shut the door in their faces. The two friends walked a little way in silence. Then they stopped and looked at each other. You said I looked fine, said the rabbit. I, I meant the tail, said the chipmunk. It is a fine tail, but you said I look splendid. I was thinking of the ears, said the rabbit. They are splendid ears. They walked on until they came once more to the looking glass pond. They looked at themselves, then they looked at each other. Then, all in a minute, off came the long ears and tail. There, cried the chipmunk. Now we look as we were meant to look, and I am bound to say, rabbit, that it is much more becoming to you. So it is to you, replied the rabbit. Now shall we call on Miss Woodchuck again? Come on, said the chipmunk. So they went to Miss Woodchuck's house and knocked once more at the door, and Miss Woodchuck opened it. Oh, she cried, Mr. Chipmunk and Mr. Rabbit, how do you do? I am so glad to see you. A happy new year to you both. The same to you, ma'am, said the rabbit and the chipmunk. End of New Year's Day in the Wood Recording by Katherine Russell, Ohio, USA Section 8 of Three Minute Stories This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Claudia Salto. Three Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards. The News from Angel Land. Oh, Harry Boy and Johnny Boy and Little Liberty, they were three happy children as ever you did see. One day there came another child. Oh, he was sweet and small, and round his cradle quickly came the other children all. Oh, what's the news from Angel Land, baby, baby? We think we still might understand. Maybe, maybe. Daddies and mammies long ago forgot the things the babies know. We hardly think we could forget. And yet and yet now harry's eyes were diamond dark and john's were starry blue and little liberty was like a rosebud dipped in dew they stood around the cradle white with rosy ribbons tied they looked into the baby's face and earnestly they cried oh what's the news from angel land baby baby we think we still might understand maybe maybe daddies and mammies long ago forgot the things the babies know we hardly think we could forget and yet and yet the baby gravely met the look of brown eyes and of blue and gravely opened his baby mouth and gravely said a goo harry and johnny shook their heads dead words too deep for me i think i used to know it though said little liberty but what's the news from angel land baby baby we think we still might understand maybe maybe daddies and mammies long ago forgot the things the babies know we hardly think we could forget and yet and yet the baby said a goo again with meaning calm and deep and then he said babi baba and then he went to sleep the children sighed and turned away but none of all the three guessed neither john nor harry boy nor little liberty he had told the news from angel land baby baby he thought that they might understand maybe 
maybe daddies and mammies long ago forgot the things the babies know the children ought not to forget and yet and yet end of the news from angel land Section 9 of Three Minute Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Claudia Salto. Three Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards. The Boastful Donkey. Adapted once upon a time there was a donkey who lived in a field where there was no pond so he had never seen his own image and he thought he was the biggest and strongest and handsomest creature in the world one day a lion came through the field and being a polite beast stopped to greet the donkey good morning friend he said what a fine day this is fine enough i dare say said the donkey i never think about the weather i have other things to think about indeed said the lion may i ask what things none of your business said the donkey rudely and he set up a loud braying thinking to frighten the lion away why do you bray asked the lion bray cried the donkey that was not braying it was roaring if you think i don't know braying from roaring said the lion still politely you are mistaken that was a bray very well shouted the donkey if that was this shall not be and he uttered a long and loud hee-haw and kicked up his heels in angry pride what do you call that he asked proudly i call it a bray replied the lion and a very ugly one you see after all you are a donkey look at the length of your ears how dare you cried the donkey my ears are the finest in the world everybody says so and as for roaring if i have not scared you yet just listen to me now and flinging up his heels again he bellowed till his own long ears tingled with a sound he expected the lion to be terrified but the lion merely smiled you certainly can make a most hideous noise he said but when all is said and done it is only a bray if you really wish to know how a roar sounds i shall be happy to oblige you the king of beasts then began to lash his tail and pretended to fall into a great passion his eyes flashed fire his tawny mane bristled he opened his great mouth and a roar like thunder filled the air the donkey after one terrified look took to his heels and scampered off as fast as he could go tumbled into a ditch and lay there all day not daring to move for fear the lion went on his way smiling it is a pity he said for a person to live in a place where he cannot see what he looks like end of the boastful donkey Chapter 10 of Three Minute Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tina Renee D'Souza. Three Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards. 10. The Cat's Name. Tom had a cat who was so white that he named her Snow. He loved Snow and thought her the best cat in the world, but she would not come when she was called. 
One day, Snow went and played in the coal bin, and when she came out, she was quite black. See, mother, said Tom, Snow cannot be Snow now, for she is black. What shall I name her? You might name her Soot, said his mother. So he named Snow Soot. Snow did not care, and Soot did not care, but neither of them came when she was called. One day, Snow saw a tin pot on the shed floor, and Soot thought there might be cream in it. And Snow went to see, and Soot fell in, and it was green paint, and when she came out, she was all green. See, mother, said Tom. My cat is not white now, so she cannot be snow, and she is not black, so she cannot be soot. What shall I name her now? You might name her grass, said his mother, till you have washed her, but I would wash her soon if I were you. So Tom named the cat grass. Snow did not care, and Soot did not care, and Grass did not care, but none of them came when they were called. How can I wash her? asked Tom, if she will not come when she is called. Let me try, said his mother. So she called, Puss, Puss, Puss. And the cat came running as fast as she could. Why, said Tom, I think her name must be Puss. <laughs> I think so too, said his mother. End of 10. The Cat's Name. Recording by Tina Renee D'Souza. Section 11 of Three Minute Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Three Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards. Suppity Sippity. Suppity Sippity, milk for my pippity, milk for my pippity poppity boy. From a big jug of it, pour a full mug of it. Sip it and sup it in comfort and joy. Sippity soppity, bread for my poppity, crusty and crumby and tender and white. Now for a bowl of it, milk for the whole of it. Sippity soppity, morning and night. End of Suppity Sippity. Section 12 of Three Minute Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Three Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards. Johnny's Red Shoes and White Stockings. For every day, Johnny always wears blue. Blue rompers in the morning when he is playing in the sandbox or helping Maggie make bread in the kitchen and a blue sailor suit in the afternoon when he goes waka waka with mama. But on Sunday afternoons, he goes waka waka with daddy, but they take mama too. And then he has on his white sailor suit and his white stockings and red shoes. Aunt Kitty brought him the shoes, and when they came, there was a china cat inside one and a tin frog inside the other. They were surprises, the cat and the frog, Aunt Kitty likes to give surprises. Well, one Sunday morning, Mama and Daddy were going to church, and Maggie was very busy, so she put Johnny in the sandbox and told him to play like a good boy, and he did. He made two forts, one with the red tin pail and one with the blue tin pail, and then he hammered on them with the old kitchen spoon and said, bang, 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 and that made a battle. While he was having the battle, the boy over the fence came and looked through the pickets and said, Hmm, I've got new shoes on. Johnny looked and he had. 
new brown shoes, the tide in front. So Johnny said, I have new shoes too, only they are not on. They are upstairs and they are red. They ain't, said the boy over the fence. He was not a very nice boy. They are, said Johnny, bright red with wankle buttons. Aunt Kitty bringed them, and there was a cat in one and a frog in the other, and they were surprises, and white stockings, too, so there. Then he stopped, for he was out of breath. Huh, said the boy over the fence. Let's see em. Johnny trotted up the back stairs and brought down the white stockings and the red shoes. They were laid out on the chair with the white suit, all ready for him to put on. He held them up so that the boy over the fence could see them and said, So there, again. It was all he could think of to say. And the boy over the fence said, Huh, again, as if that was all he could think of to say. Just then Maggie opened the kitchen door and said, Come in this minute of time, Johnny boy, and get your luncheon. See the nice cracker and the lovely mug of milk Maggie has for you. Johnny was hungry, and he dropped the red shoes and white stockings and ran in to have his luncheon. While he was eating it, Maggie told him the story of the little red hen. Mama says it is red hen, really, but Maggie always says it the other way, and Johnny likes it better. And then she said it was time for his nap, and she whisked him upstairs and tucked him up in his crib and told him to go to sleep like a good boy, and he went. By and by he woke up, and Mama came in to dress him for dinner. She washed his face and hands and brushed his hair and put on his white sailor suit, and then she said, Why, wherever are the shoes and stockings? She looked under the chair and on the bureau and under the bed. Johnny, she said, I cannot find your red shoes and white stockings. I put them here with your suit, and now they are gone. Oh, said Johnny. Do you know where they are, dear? asked Mama. Oh, said Johnny again. I think they are in the sandbox. In the sandbox, said Mama. The boy over the fence said they wasn't red, said Johnny. And they was, and I gotted them and showed him, and then Maggie called me, and, and I think that is all I know. My goodness, said Mama. And she ran downstairs and out into the yard to the sandbox. But no red shoes or white stockings were there. Mama looked all about carefully. There was the red tin pail and the blue tin pail, both turned upside down. And the old kitchen spoon laid across them. And there were the marks of Johnny's moccasins. And, oh, there were the marks of another pair of shoes, a little bigger than Johnny's, with heels to them. My goodness said Mama, you don't suppose, but she did not say what she didn't suppose. She looked over toward the next yard. There was no one there, but there were muddy footmarks leading from the fence to the sandbox, and sandy footmarks leading back from the sandbox to the fence. Now, said Mama, I am afraid, but she did not say what she was afraid of. Just as she was stepping out of the sandbox, her foot struck against the red tin pail and knocked it over, and what do you think? Inside of the pail was one red shoe and one white stocking. My goodness, said Mama again. Then she turned over the blue tin pail, and there was the other red shoe and the other white stocking. Mama looked very severely over the fence, but no one was there. So she took the shoes and stockings upstairs and showed them to Johnny, Oh, said Johnny. She told him where she had found them, and then she put them away in the drawer and brought out Johnny's old brown moccasins and a pair of rather old brown stockings. You shall wear these today, said Mama. But why, said Johnny, I like my red shoes and white stockings best. But you took them out and left them in the sandbox, said Mama. But I did forget, said Johnny, but this will help you to remember, said Mama. And it did. End of Johnny's Red Shoes and White Stockings Recording by Katherine Russell, Ohio, USA Section 13 of Three Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Foolish Tortoise Adapted Close beside the pool of the blue lotus lived the two geese, White Wings and Greyback, and in the pool lived the tortoise, Shelly Neck, and the three were good friends. One night, Shelly Neck heard two fishermen talking together beside the pool. Tomorrow morning, they said, we will lay our nets and catch that old tortoise and cook him for our dinner. Shelly Neck was much frightened, and when the men were gone, he called his friends the geese and begged them to save him. We will save you, said White Wings. But you must do what we tell you to do, said Greyback. I will, I will, cried poor Shelly Neck. The two geese waddled about looking till they found a stick. Now, said White Wings, take this in your mouth and hold on tight. And remember, said Greyback, that once you have taken hold, you must not let go till we bid you. The tortoise promised and took hold on the middle of the stick with his strong jaws. Then White Wings took one end of the stick in his bill and Greyback took the other and they flew high up in the air over the roofs of the houses. All the people came running to see this strange sight. Look, look, cried one, see the flying tortoise. Ho, said another, who was one of the fishermen, he has no wings. Soon he will forget and open his mouth, and then down he will come, and we shall have him for dinner. I will not let go. You shall not have me for dinner, cried Shelly Neck. Crash! Down he fell on the hard ground. When the fishermen picked him up, he was dead, and they did have him for dinner. White Wing and Greyback flew sadly away. We did our best, they said, but a fool cannot be saved from his folly. End of story The Foolish Tortoise this recording is in the public domain, recorded by Dini Stain in Kelowna, Canada. Section 14 of 3 Minute Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 3 Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards. THE GARDEN GATE Early and late, early and late, little boy swings on the garden gate. It isn't a gate, it's a motor car. I'm travelling fast and I'm travelling far. I toot my horn and I turn my wheel, and nobody knows how grand I feel. Early and late, early and late, little boy swings on the garden gate. It isn't a gate, it's a great big ship. I'm off to the pole on a sploring trip. I'll ride a white bear, holding on by his hair, and I'll hurry him up with a whale-skin whip. Early and late, early and late, little boy swings on the garden gate. It isn't a gate, it's a big balloon. I'm going to sail till I reach the moon. I'll play with the man as hard as I can, and I'll stir up the stars with a great horn spoon. Early and late, Early and late, little boy swings on the garden gate. It isn't a gate, it's... Off runs he. His mother is calling. Come in to tea. It's a wonderful gate, but it just isn't able to turn itself into a supper table. End of The Garden Gate Recording by Iswa In Belgium, in August 2015「Section 15 of Three Minute Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Mary Maxwell. Three Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards. Little Cat's Valentine. Great old dog was taking a nap before the parlor fire. He lay stretched out on the white bear skin and reached almost from end to end, for he was a very great old dog indeed. By and by he woke up and saw little dog sitting in front of him looking very melancholy. 
"'What's the matter, young one?' said great old dog. "'Where's little cat?' "'I don't know,' said little dog dolefully. "'We don't speak to each other any more.' "'Woof!' said great old dog. "'Since when?' "'Since half an hour.' "'Woof!' said great old dog. "'Why?' "'She was horrid to me,' said little dog, "'about a bone, and—' "'And then I was horrid to her. "'And you think two wrongs make a right?' said great old dog. They don't. That is monkey arithmetic, not fit for respectable dogs and cats. My advice to you is to make it up as soon as you can. But she says she will never speak to me again, said little dog piteously. Great old dog yawned so wide that little dog could have got inside his mouth and turned around. She will, he said. How do you know, great old dog? Woof, I know cats. I think she's gone out to see old cat in the barn, little dog continued. Perhaps she may live out there and never come back. She'll come back, said great old dog. She will miss you just as much as you miss her. Make it up, I tell you. Quarreling is the silliest thing there is. And he went to sleep again. Oh dear, said little dog. I do miss little cat dreadfully. And the door is shut. Oh, oh dear. Little girl was sitting at the desk doing things with gold and silver paper. Little dog went up to her and asked very prettily to be let out, but little girl was not so clever as usual. What is the matter, little dog, she asked. Do you want a valentine? Please let me out, said little dog, but she thought he said, yep. Listen, little dog, she said, will this do? She took up a frilled sheet with gold hearts on it and read, if your heart is true as mine, come and be my valentine. Please let me out, said little dog, but she thought he said, yep. This is Valentine's Day, little dog, little girl went on. You ought to send a valentine to little cat. If your heart is true as mine, come and be my valentine. Why, little dog, you should be her valentine. Come here, sir. Little girl took a sheet of lace paper, crimped it into a frill, and tucked it into little dog's collar. It tickled him woefully, but he said not a word, for he loved little girl almost next to little cat. You are lovely, little dog, said little girl. You are the best valentine I've made yet. Wait now. She made a big star of gold paper and pinned it to his collar. Then she made two little stars and pasted them on the tips of his ears. You are a lovely valentine, she cried, clapping her hands. And there is little cat mewing to be let in this minute. Now when I open the door, little dog, you go straight up to her and say, If your heart is true as mine, let me be your valentine. She opened the door and little cat started to come in. But when she saw Little Dog, she stopped and looked shy. Little Dog went up to her and said, If your heart is true as mine, Little Cat, I am sorry. I was horrid about the bone. Let me be your valentine, and I want to make up. Oh, Little Dog, said Little Cat, I was horrid first, and I was just coming to say I was sorry. Let's never quarrel again, Little Dog. It is so lonely. Dear little things, said Little Girl, they are rubbing noses and telling each other something. Oh, dear. And I was cross to brother this morning. I'm going to find him this minute and say I'm sorry and ask him to be my valentine. End of Little Cat's Valentine Section 16 of Three Minute Stories This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. Three Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards. To My Valentine. Dear, will you be mine, my little Valentine? I'll meet you and greet you and dress you up so fine. A cookie for your hat and a pancake for your coat. We'll hollow out a pumpkin shell and use it for a boat dear will you be mine my little valentine i'll meet you and treat you and take you out to dine we'll have gold and silver fish in a gold and silver dish we'll serve them up with diamond sauce and then how they will shine end of to my valentine Section 17 of Three Minute Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain.
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. Three Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards. March. Blow, march, blow. Go, winter, go. Drive away, strive away. Blow, march, blow. Blow, march, blow. Grow, grass, grow. Crocus cup, twinkle up. Blow, march, blow. Blow, march, blow. Flow, water, flow. River run, just for fun. Blow, march, blow. End of March Chapter 18 of Three Minute Stories This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tina Renee D'Souza Three Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards Something New There's a new thing at our house. It's not a cat. It's not a mouse. It's not a bird. It's not a dog. It's not a monkey or a frog. A sweeter thing than any other. It's just a little baby brother. End of Something New Recording by Tina Renee D'Souza Section 19 of Three Minute Stories this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kyle Stadelhofer, Los Angeles, California. Three Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards. Mr. Sparrow's Bath. One day, Johnny followed Mama up into the attic, where there are all kinds of pleasant things and he saw a very pleasant thing indeed. It was a small dish, white with pink roses all over it. Really and truly, it was the prettiest dish that there ever was. Johnny said, Oh, 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 may I have that dish for mine? Mama looked, and then she took the dish in her hand and thought a minute. Mama always likes to be sure about things before she says yes for fear that it might not really be yes after all. But she nodded her head and said, Yes, Johnny, you may have it. Oh, oh, said Johnny. For my very own? For your very own. The rest of the set is broken, and I have just kept this dish because it's so pretty. Now you may take it down to the nursery and have it for a bath for Flora. Flora was a small doll, all china, and her clothes came off, so she could have a bath any time, and Johnny often gave her one. Now he gave her one in the rosy posy dish, and it was just exactly the right size, and Johnny was so pleased, and he said, Oh, thank you, dear Mama, without having to be told. Sometimes he forgets to say thank you but he is getting to be quite good about it. The next time Johnny went downstairs, he took the doll's bath to show to Maggie, and she said twas the pick of the world for a dish, and asked Johnny to lave her bake a cake in it. But Johnny said, No, not now, though perhaps by and by, for now he must take it out to show to Muffy. Muffet was out in the sandbox, and when Johnny showed her the dish, she mewed and rubbed against his legs and seemed to want something very much. Maggie, said Johnny, Muffy wants something. What do you suppose it is? Sure she might be wanting a sup of milk, said Maggie. Bring me here that grand dish, and we'll give the creeter a sup in itself. And won't she be the proud kitty? That is the way Maggie talks. It's a nice, funny way, Johnny thinks. 
Well, so Maggie filled the pretty dish with milk, and Johnny set it down in the sandbox before Muffet, and she lapped it up every single drop, purring all the time. Johnny was watching her when Mama called him in to take a nap. Muffet had not quite finished, so he left the dish standing and ran in to Mama, and then he went for his nap. When he woke up, it was raining hard, and it rained all afternoon, so he did not go out again, but stayed in the nursery building a choo-choo house. The next morning was bright and clear, and the very first thing Johnny thought of when he had had his bath and when Mama was dressing him was the rosy posy dish. I want my dis, said Johnny, to give Flora her bath. So Mama looked for the dish all over the nursery, but it was not to be found. Where did you leave it, Johnny boy? said Mama. Think a minute. So Johnny thought a minute, and then he remembered. I left it in the sandbox, he said. Muffy was very thirsty, and she was drinking out of it, and you called me, and she hadn't finished. And so you see, and so you see, and Mama said she saw. Then she looked out of the window and said, yes, there was a dish right in the sandbox beside the red tin pail and the blue tin pail and the old kitchen spoon. Then she said, oh, oh, Johnny, come here and look. So Johnny went to the window and stood on his tippy toe toes and looked. And what do you think he saw? A little brown sparrow had come fluttering down and was drinking out of the rosy posy dish. You see, it had rained all night, so the dish was full of water. He perched on the edge and dipped his little beak in and drank and drank. He must have been very thirsty. And then, oh, oh, but what did he do but hop down into the dish and begin taking his bath? He splashed and he shook himself and he rustled his feathers and then he splashed again. Oh, said Johnny. Oh, Mama, he's doing it all himself. Nobody told him to, not one bit. No, indeed, said Mama. He likes to take his bath and be clean just as Johnny does. He knows it feels good to be clean. Mama, said Johnny, I want to tell you something. Shall we have something else for Flora and let the rosy posy dish be the sparrow's bath, his auntie dauntie? Suppose we do, said Mama, and they did. End of Mr. Sparrow's Bath Chapter 20 of Three Minute Stories This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tina Renee D'Souza Three Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards Little Girl When little girl wakes in the morning gay, then everybody is glad. The cat in the kitchen sits purring away, and the puppy dog barks like mad. The bell in the steeple turns head over heels, that's his way of showing how glad he feels. And all the wide world seems to say, Our dear little girl is happy today. When little girl wakes in the morning sad, Then everybody must mourn. The little birds sigh and the big birds cry, And the scarecrow sobs in the corn. The fishes all pull their hankies out and go and weep with the poor horn pout. And the clock says, talk, I'm sorry to say our dear little girl is sad today. So little girl, when you go Betty at night, put a smile right under your pillow. And when you wake up, just slip it on tight and wear it all day with a will. Oh, then the sun will shine and the wind will blow and the bells will ring ho, 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 ho. For in all the wide world, there's naught can be so sweet as a happy child to see. End of Little Girl
Recording by Tina Renee D'Souza. Section 21 of Three Minute Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Son of the Exiles. Three Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards. How Mr. Peacock Went to the Fair. Mr. Peacock was proud. He had a fine long train, a splendid crest, and the gayest blue-green coat that ever was seen, and all day long he would strut up and down the barnyard and say, See what a beauty I am. The geese and ducks and turkeys were much displeased at this. Beauty indeed, they said. Of what use is your beauty? Can it hatch eggs? Tell us that. And they turned their backs and walked away. These are stupid creatures, said Mr. Peacock. Why should I stay among them? I will go to the fair, for there people will see my beauty and admire it. So he spread his tail like a fan, raised his crested head, and strutted off down the road to the fair. Pretty soon he met some young men who also were going to the fair. Aha, uh -huh, said Mr. Peacock. These people will admire me and he strutted more than ever. Look, said the young men, what a fine peacock, and what splendid feathers he has. They are just what we want for our hats. They surrounded Mr. Peacock, and in spite of his screams of rage and terror, tore out three or four of his finest tail feathers, and went away laughing. Presently he fell in with a large flock of geese, which a boy was driving to the fair to sell, he spread his tail and tried to push his way to the head of the flock, but they took no notice of him and waddled steadily on, keeping close together. Make way, you stupid creatures, said Mr. Peacock. Keep your dirty feet off my fine train. Honk, said an old grey goose, the grandmother of the flock. Keep your train from out under our feet, Mr. Strut. Who asked you to join our company? Join your company indeed, cried Mr. Peacock. Get out of my way, you rude, clumsy thing, and learn how to treat your betters. And he gave the goose a hard peck. When the other geese, who loved their grandmother, saw this, they all fell upon Mr. Peacock and beat and pecked and hustled him till he ran screaming away, dragging his tail behind him. He was now in a sad way, covered with dust, and many of his finest feathers were torn and broken. But still, when he came to the fair, he spread his tail, reared his crest, and made as much of himself as he could. I am still handsomer than anyone else, he said, and people will be sure to admire me. Look there, said a man, there is a peacock. Let us kill and stuff him, and add him to our show. And he chased Mr. Peacock, who ran off screaming with terror. Coming round a corner, he ran into a large dog who was coming the other way. Get out of my way, screamed Mr. Peacock. Get out of mine, growled Mr. Dog, and he grabbed Mr. Peacock by the neck, shook him hard, and tore out a great mouthful of feathers. More dead than alive, the poor Peacock ran and ran and ran and never stopped till he got home. The geese and turkeys looked at him in great surprise. Who is this wretched shabby bird? They asked each other. It can't possibly be Mr. Peacock. Yes, sobbed the poor creature. It is I, and I have left my pride behind. If you will only let me stay with you, I will do my best to hatch eggs. But he never could. End of How Mr. Peacock Went to the Fair Recording by Son of the Exiles Chapter 22 of Three Minute Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tina Renee D'Souza. 
Three Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards. Little Boy Mother, the hen is cackling. What is she trying to say? She says, Cluck, cluck, I humbly beg to tell you I've laid an egg for little boy today. Oh, oh, is it so? Truly now, I did not know. But in return, what shall I give? Be kind, be kind to all that live. Mother, the cow is lowing. What is she trying to say? Milk and cream and butter and cheese. Good people, I have brought you these for little boy today. Oh, oh, is it so? Truly now, I did not know. But in return, what shall I give? Be kind, be kind to all that live. Mother, the sheep is bleeding. What is she trying to say? She says, I'll give my fleecy wool to make warm clothes for play and school for little boy today. Oh, oh, is it so? Truly now, I did not know. But in return, what shall I give? Be kind, be kind to all that live. End of Little Boy Recording by Tina Renee D'Souza Section 23 of Three Minute Stories This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Laura Ivers Three Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards Faithful Trusty Where are you going in such a haste, friend? said Trusty, the shepherd's dog, to a great wolf that was jogging along the same road. If I were sure you would not betray my secret, said the wolf, with a sly leer, I would let you know. You need not fear me. I shall tell no one a word of the matter, said Trusty. Well then, said the wolf, you must know, as I was prowling around yonder cottage, I saw the farmer's wife put a fine baby into the cradle, and heard her say, Lie still, my darling, and go to sleep, while I run down to the village to buy bread for your father's supper. As soon as the babe is asleep, I shall go and fetch it. It is fair and fat and will make a nice supper for me and my cubs. Then, said Trusty, I would advise you to wait a little longer, for I saw the baby's mother step into the next house to speak to a neighbour. Take care lest you are seen. The wolf thanked the dog for his good advice, for he did not know that the baby belonged to Trusty's master, and he said he would take heed and keep close. Then Trusty ran home with all the speed he could. The door was ajar, and the innocent baby was fast asleep in the cradle. So he lay down on the mat behind the door and listened for the coming of the wolf. It was not long before he heard the tread of the wolf's feet on the gravel path, and in another minute the savage beast was in the room and stealing with cautious steps to the cradle. But just as he was preparing to seize the poor baby, Trusty sprang upon him, and after a fierce struggle, laid him dead on the floor. The first thing the mother saw on her return was the wolf, dead at the foot of the cradle, while the baby, unhurt, lay soundly sleeping on his little pillow, and faithful Trusty watching beside him. She flew to look the little one all over, to make sure that he was safe and sound, and then, Oh, how she patted and fondled the good dog who had saved her darling's life. She called in all the neighbours and told them what Trusty had done, and from that time he became the pet of the whole village, and all the mothers wished they had such a dog to watch over their children. End of Faithful Trusty
This has been a LibriVox recording by Laura Ivers. Section 24 of Three Minute Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Three Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards. The Grateful Crane Adapted. Once a poor crane was caught in a net and could not get out. She fluttered and flapped her wings. But it was of no use. She was held fast. Oh, she cried, what will become of me if I cannot break this net? The hunter will come and kill me, or else I shall die of hunger. And if I die, who will care for my poor little young ones in the nest? They must perish also if I do not come back to feed them. Now Trusty, the same Trusty who saved the baby's life, was in the next field and heard the poor crane's cries. He jumped over the fence and, seizing the net in his teeth, quickly tore it in pieces. There, he said, now fly back to your young ones, ma'am, and good luck to you all. The crane thanked him a thousand times. Oh, I wish all dogs were like you, she said, and I wish I could do something to help you as you have helped me. Who knows, said Trusty, some day I may need your help in turn, and then you may remember me. My old mother used to say to me, to do a kind deed whenever we can is good for bird and beast and man. Then Trusty went back to mind his master sheep, and Mrs. Crane flew to her nest and fed and tended her crane babies. Sometime after this she was flying homeward and stopped at a clear pool to drink. As she did so she heard a sad moaning sound, and looking about, whom should she see but good Trusty? lying on the ground, almost at the point of death. She flew to him. Oh, my good, kind friend, she cried, what has happened to you? A bone's <coughs> stuck in my throat, said the dog. I'm choking <coughs> to death. Now thank heavens for my long bill, said Mrs. Crane. Open your mouth, good, kind friend, and let me see what I can do. Trusty opened his mouth wide. The crane darted in her long, slender bill, and within a few tugs loosened the bone and finally got it out. "'Oh, you kind, friendly bird!' cried the dog, as he sprang to his feet and campered joyfully about. "'How shall I ever reward you for saving my life?' "'Did you not save mine first? said Mrs. Crane. "'Shake paws and claws, friend Trusty. I have only learned your mother's lesson which you taught me, that to do a kind deed whenever we can is good End for birth of the and grateful beast crane. and man. Read by Krista. Section 25 of Three Minute Stories this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Claudia Salto. Three Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards. The King of the Fen. Adapted. I will be king of the fen said croaker the frog leaping out of the brook upon the dry land you king indeed said slyboots a fine fat field mouse with a long tail and bright eyes jumping out of his hole at the foot of a hazel bush which grew near i am larger than you and i will be king and the frogs shall be my subjects and cut rushes and bring me dry moss to line my nest and Snyboot strutted about and gave himself a great many airs i will never consent to be ruled by a mouse replied the frog with a disdainful air how finely king Slyboots would sound quite as well as king croaker retorted the mouse then the frog flew into a great passion and hopped so high and croaked so loud that the mouse crept a little farther from him, 
for frogs like children look very ugly when they are out of temper and slyboots did not much like the idea of being touched by his cold paws and he said to himself in spite of this frog's looking so fierce and talking so loud i should not wonder if he were a coward at heart so he turned to the frog and said as we both wish to be king of the fen i know of no way of ending the dispute but by fighting and the one that wins the fight shall be king over the other then the frog said very well we will each bring a friend to see fair play to-morrow at twelve o'clock i shall be ready to take the field and if you fail to meet me here i shall be king of the fen and the mice shall be my servants for croker thought slyboots was braver in word than in deed as cowards are often the foremost to talk of fighting then the frog retired among the bulrushes and the mouse ran home to his hole under the nut tree the two rivals awoke next morning by break of day to prepare for the combat which was to take place at noon the frog was very much afraid of slyboots sharp teeth and claws so he fell to work and made a shield from the bark of an old willow tree and then he plucked a long bulrush for a spear now said he i am well armed i have a shield to defend myself and a spear to attack the enemy with if i had but a brave friend to be my second in the fight i should do very well i will be your second said a great pike raising his head above the water i will lie close to the bank among these rushes and if you break your spear come to me and i will procure you another the frog was well pleased at this offer i shall beat slyboots in a little time said he with such weapons and so good a friend slyboots in the meantime was not idle he sharpened his teeth and his claws and chose a light twig from the hazel bush and said i only want now a friend to be my second and see fair play a great hawk which was hovering near said mr slyboots you may command my services at any hour you please to name now slyboots was somewhat afraid of the hawk for he thought he had a rather hungry look about the eyes and beak but he dared not refuse his offer lest he should give offence so he thanked him for his kindness and at the appointed hour they went to the spot where the frog was waiting for them the pike lay in the hole among the rushes and the hawk sat on the bough of a tree close by the frog and the mouse looked at one another for a few minutes and shook their weapons at last the hawk and the pike gave signal for the fight to begin the battle was long and fierce on both sides and for some time it was doubtful which would win at last the frog seemed to gain ground but at the very minute that he seemed to be winning his spear broke in pieces alas croaked he in a tone of dismay what shall i do who will give me another weapon here is one cried his friend the pike from among the rushes the frog gave a leap of joy and sprang toward the pike who opening his mouth quickly put an end to the battle by swallowing the hapless frog at one mouthful i am king of the fen now cried slyboots with a joyful squeak long live your majesty exclaimed the crafty hawk as he spoke he darted from the tree and pouncing upon the new monarch bore him away in his claws and put an end to his reign and his life at the same moment end of 
the king of the fen section 26 of three minute stories this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org three minute stories by laura e richards the swing swing and ho the old swing and hey the old swing in the orchard it groans and it creaks it squawks and it squeaks you'd think twas most cruelly tortured hey the old swing and ho the old swing all under the apple tree swaying oh dear how they shake me they surely will break me it seems to be constantly saying hey the old swing and ho the old swing for all its lamenting and sighing just give it a push and it's off with a rush up into the apple boughs flying hey the old swing and ho the old swing it's off and away with a wheel now old swing stop your moaning your dreary or honing i'm sure you're enjoying it still now end of the swing recording by iswa in belgium in august 2015「Chapter 27 of Three Minute Stories」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tina Renee D'Souza Three Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards The Trees summer is gone said the trees the fall of the year is come and it is time for us to dress up and be gay i shall wear red said a maple sunset red is my color yellow for me said another my dress shall be like pure gold i choose purple said the ash it is the color of kings and suits me very well what will you wear they all said to the little fir. I have no other dress, said the fir sadly. I must wear my plain green frock. Tee hee hee, laughed the maples and birches and ash trees, rustling their leaves and nodding their heads. She has but one dress. What a poor thing she is. But the old pine waved his dark branches and said, Hush, hush, I know what I know. We know, too, cried the maples. We know that in snow time Santa Claus comes and chooses the finest tree and dresses it in gold and silver and hangs stars all over it. That is why we wish to be fine and gay. Hush, hush, said the old pine. I know what I know. So the trees put on their gay robes, gold and red and purple, and each one was finer than the rest. Only the little fir and the great old pine stayed just as they were in their plain green dresses. Now it grew cold, and a bleak wind blew through the forest. The trees shivered and drew their bright robes close around them. Colder still it grew, and snow fell, and the wind moaned. One day Jack Frost came in his silver coat and touched the bright leaves with his shining brush, and they curled up and turned brown, and one by one fell rustling to the ground. Soon the poor maples and birches, and the purple ash, who thought he looked like a king, stood all bare. And the wind blew through their branches, and they shook with the cold. 
They looked at the fur and wished that they had her warm green dress. Now came Santa Claus, driving his reindeer team through the forest, cracking his whip and jingling his bells. He looked at the trees with his bright eyes. Ho, ho, he said, as he saw the maples and birches. What a beggarly set! Why, they have not a cloak among them to keep them warm. These will never do for me. But now he saw the little fir, and a smile came over his face. This is the tree for me, he cried. Will you come with me, little fir, and be the children's tree, and make many hearts glad? That I will, said the little fir gladly. So Santa Claus took her away and dressed her in gold and silver and hung bright stars all over her, and she became the Christmas tree, and many hearts were glad because of her. Hush, hush, said the old pine. I knew what I knew. End of the Trees Recording by Tina Renee D'Souza Chapter 28 of Three Minute Stories This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Eric Burns, Bozeman, Montana. Three Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards. Chapter 28, The Leprechaun. Come tell Uncle Sean, says Rafferty's Pat. On Patrick's Day, what would they be at in Ireland and Ireland, in Ireland over the say? Would they have the procession as we do here, banners and shamrocks far and near? Or would they do anything anyways queer in Ireland or the say? Wisha now, wisha now, mind what you're at. Lend me the ears of ye, Rafferty's Pat. In Ireland, in Ireland, in Ireland or the say, one thing on St. Patrick's Day does be. If a boy should be having the luck to say, he's safe to climb to the top of the tree in Ireland or the say. For my old grandmother told me so, and wisha, but she was the one to know. In Ireland, in Ireland, in Ireland o'er the say. To make your fortune now, Nelligan's Sean, there's just one place where you must be gone, and that's to the dance of the leprechaun, in Ireland o'er the say. The leprechaun's the height of me thumb, he's sharp as a pin and complete as a crumb, in Ireland, in Ireland, in Ireland o'er the say. On Patrick's night he be given a dance, and oh, it's the boy would be having the chance, could he hold him still with the strength of his glance, in Ireland o'er the say. He be asking all manner of beastie and bird, and fair they be coming, I give you me word, in Ireland, in Ireland, in Ireland o'er the say. The rabbit would come with his new shillelagh, the fox and the goat would be footing it gaily, the squirrel would be there with his bush for a taily, in Ireland o'er the say. The pig brought the music and he for to play on a fine concertina, my grandmother say, in Ireland, in Ireland, in Ireland o'er the say. Himself would be dancing to bait all the rest, for all the world knows how the pig do be blessed with St. Patrick, long life to him, like an best, in Ireland o'er the say. The leprechaun he be the judge of the dance, and while he be watching it, then is your chance. In Ireland, in Ireland, in Ireland, o'er the say. For fix him once with the strength of your eye, you can hold him there till he's like to die, and he'll give ye gold for your life's supply, in Ireland, o'er the say. And oh, Uncle Sean, says Rafferty's Pat, and did ye be going there? Tell about that, in Ireland, in Ireland, in Ireland, o'er the say. Musha now, wisha now, sure, but a tried, and a lay all night on the cold hillside, but twas only myself that was like to have died in Ireland o'er the say. But mind what I'm telling you, Rafferty's Pat, ye'd always be thinking of what ye were at in Ireland, in Ireland, in Ireland by the say. And on Patrick's night, if ye hear the pig play, or meet with a rabbit a dancing so gay, Sure, the leprechaun is not far away in Ireland or the sea. End of chapter 28. 
Read by Eric Burns, Bozeman, Montana. Section 29 of Three Minute Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Katherine Russell, Ohio, USA. Three Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards. The Deer and the Crow. Adapted. Once upon a time, in a deep wood, lived a deer and a crow, who were great friends and loved each other dearly. One day, as the deer was roaming about alone, he met Smallwit, the jackal. Smallwit was hungry, and when he saw the fine, fat deer, he said to himself, Oh, ho, if only I could have this fat deer for my supper. So he went up to the deer, hanging his head and looking very sad. Who are you, friend? asked the deer. And why do you look so sad? My name is Smallwit, said the jackal, and I am sad because I have not a friend in the world. Ah, if I could win your friendship, how happy I should be. Very well, said the deer, who was very good-natured. Come with me, and we will be friends. He led the way to his home, and the jackal followed him. As they drew near, Sharp Sense, the crow, called from the tree where he was perching. "'Who is this number two, friend deer?' "'It is Smallwit the jackal,' said the deer. "'He is lonely and wishes to be our friend.' "'Friendship with stranger, friendship with danger,' said the crow. "'Nay,' said the deer, "'I like this rhyme better. "'Foe is friend, and friend is foe, "'as our actions make them so.' "'Very good,' said Sharp Sense, "'as you will.' "'Next morning they went off hunting.' And the jackal said to the deer, I know a field of sweet corn, and I will take you there. So the deer followed Smallwit, and sure enough, they came to a field of sweet young corn. You are a friend indeed, cried the deer, and he feasted, till suddenly he fell into a snare which the farmer had laid. Alas, cried the deer, friend Smallwit, here am I caught by the feet and cannot move. Come, I pray you, and gnaw these cords with your sharp teeth and set me free. The jackal came and looked at the snare. That will hold you fast enough, he said. Today is a fast day, but tomorrow I will have a fine feast on your fat carcass, my foolish friend. And off he went. Presently came along Sharp Sense, the crow, who had been looking for his friend. Alas, he cried, how did this happen, friend dear? "'Through not minding what you said,' replied the deer. "'Well,' said the crow, "'we must do what we can. "'Here comes the farmer. "'Do you lie still and pretend to be dead until I croak, "'then spring up and be off.' "'The farmer came along and saw our friend lying perfectly still. "'Aha!' he cried. "'This fellow will eat no more of my corn.' "'He stooped down and untied the cords of the snare, "'meaning to carry off the dead deer.' But at that moment, the crow gave a loud, Caw! Up sprang the deer, and in a moment was safe in the forest. The farmer flung a club after him. It hit Smallwit, the jackal, who was lurking nearby, hoping to have a share of the spoil, and killed him. And the two friends went home happy. End of The Deer and the Crow Recording by Katherine Russell, Ohio, USA Section 30 of Three Minute Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Three Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards. Little Gold Star. In a southern garden lived a family of green lizards under the roots of a palm tree. They were merry little creatures, and their parents loved them dearly. One day, Father Lizard said to the children, Your mother and I must go away this morning. Now be good children. Stay close together and be sure that one of you keeps watch for fear of snakes and hawks. The little lizards promised, and for some time they were very careful. First one kept watch, and then another. But at length Sprightly said, 
there is no danger near why should we not all play together just for a little while oh dear they forgot their promise and see what came of it while they were playing merrily a great snake glided quietly out from the grass seized poor sprightly and carried her off to his den the other lizards fled in terror swift foot ran up the tree long tail hid in the nest and gold star ran away and away to the farthest end of the garden she did not dare to go home again but found a hole in the bank near a summer house and slipping into it stayed all night weeping for the death of her dear sprightly next day she tried to find her way home but the garden was large and she was too afraid of snakes to go far so she decided to stay where she was and make her home in the hole by the summer house one day as she was lying in the sun gold star saw a boy standing near her with a cane in his hand at first she was afraid to move fearing he might strike her but carlos for that was the boy's name was fond of lizards and would not have hurt her for the world he spoke softly to gold star and she soon saw that he was kind and good he stroked her gently first with a green leaf and then with his hand and gold star lay still and was not afraid any more they became great friends and carlos came every day to see his pretty lizard and play with her one day as he was coming down the garden walk he saw a large hawk hovering in the air near the summer house just about to dart down on something ah oh, my lizard my lizard cried carlos and he ran as fast as he could to the spot shouting and waving his arms the hawk flew screaming away and gold star ran to carlos and crept inside his jacket she could not speak but he knew that she was glad and perhaps was trying to thank him in her own way one very hot day carlos was taking a nap in the summer house when he was waked by something running over his face he brushed it away without opening his eyes but it came again and still again in fact he could not get rid of it at last he sat up wide awake and very angry and found that it was gold star he tried to shake her off but she ran into his bosom he was going to pull her out in a pet when looking down he saw a large snake with head raised and glittering eyes gliding slowly toward him he knew its bite was fatal and he sprang up with a loud cry the snake stopped and then turning glided away into the bushes very gently carlos drew his little pet from his bosom and stroked her green and golden back dear gold star he said if i saved you from the hawk you have saved me from the serpent i will love you and take care of you as long as you live and he did end of little gold star this was read by me melissa reynolds or username melrin thanks for listening section 31 of three minute stories this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Three Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards The Broom Swish, 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 a servant does my lady wish. Here I hang against the wall, spruce and slender, straight and tall. Take me down, and then you know, swiftly to my work I'll go steady even strokes and strong so i sweep the dust along throw the windows wide that so out the dusky cloud may go swish and swish now whirl away no more dust for us today in the corners now i rout poking every atom out at the ceiling now i dash lurking spiders fill my lash cobweb fly and spider gray out you come away away swish swee swish swee sweeping is the game for me 
If my little maid you mean, still to keep things neat and clean, trim and shining in your room, come to me, your friend the broom. End of the broom. Recording by Iswa in Belgium in August 2015. Section 32 of Three Minute Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sonia. Three Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards. The Clever Crows. Adapted. A pair of crows had their nest in a certain tree. It was a fine tree and suited them well, but they had a bad neighbor, a black snake who often stole and ate their young ones. Husband, said Mrs. Crow, we must leave this pleasant home of ours. We shall never be able to rear our children while that bad snake is there. My dear, replied Mr. Crow, think no more about him. I have had enough of black snake, and I am going to get rid of him. What can you do against a huge snake like that? asked Mrs. Crow. Listen, said Mr. Crow. As you know, the prince comes every day to bathe in the fountain under our tree. He has a fine gold chain, and he takes it off before he goes into the water, and lays it on a stone. Tomorrow, when he does this, do you take the chain in your beak, for I shall be away getting food for the babies, and drop it into the hollow of the tree, taking care to give some good loud calls while you do so. Then wait and see what happens. Sure enough, next morning the young prince came as usual to bathe in the clear fountain. He took off his gold chain and laid it on a stone, just as Mr. Crow said he would. Then he began to take off his robes. Just then down flew Mrs. Crow, took the chain in her yellow bill, and flew up into the branches with it. Oh, my chain! My chain! cried the prince. That crow has flown away with it. Have peace, your highness, replied his servant. The bird has not flown far. She has this instant dropped the chain into a hole in the tree, and I will climb up and get it. Up climbed the servant and looked down into the hole. Do you see my chain? cried the prince. Yes, said the servant. I see it, shining in the hole. But I see something else that is not so pretty. The head of a great ugly black snake. If your highness will throw me up a stone, I will kill the creature, for it is a poisonous snake. So the prince threw up a stone, and the servant caught it, and killed the snake with it. Then he reached down into the hole, pulled out the gold chain, and took it back to his master, who thanked him kindly. Ah, said Mrs. Crow, he is glad to get back his fine jewel, but I am far happier, for I have my baby safe and sound. See what it is to have a clever husband. I must be sure to have everything he likes best for supper tonight. So she did. I do not know what crows like best for supper, so I cannot tell you, but they had a wonderful feast, and the little ones picked the bones, and there was no happier family in all the forest than the crow family. End of the Clever Crows Section 33 of Three Minute Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bev Stevens. Three Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards. The John Betty Table. Twice one is two, we make our bow to you. Twice two is four, we dance upon the floor. Twice three is six, we build a house with bricks. Twice four is eight, we swing upon the gate. Twice five is ten, we chase the neighbor's hen. Twice six is twelve, in mud we dig and delve. Twice seven is fourteen, we hear old piggy snorting. Twice eight is sixteen, we have some little chicks seen. Twice nine is eighteen, we see our nursey waiting. Twice ten is twenty, we've bread and jam in plenty. Twice eleven is twenty-two, I'm put to bed and so are you. 
twice twelve is twenty-four. Put out the light and shut the door. Three times three is nine. I'll give you help of mine. Three times four is twelve. This axe has lost its health. Three times five is fifteen. Ugh! Father's pipe I've whiffed in. Three times six is eighteen. We think we'll go a skating. Three times seven is twenty one. We buy ourselves a plummy bun. Three times eight is twenty four. We eat it up and ask for more. Three times nine is twenty seven. John is a horse and must be driven. Three times ten is thirty. Dear Betty's face is dirty. Three times eleven is thirty three. We sing hi diddle diddle dee. Three times twelve is thirty six. We play our nursey pleasant tricks. Four times four is sixteen. The dolly's leg we've fixed in. Four times five is twenty. Miss Betty's frock is dainty. Four times six is twenty-four. We like to thump upon the door. Four times seven is twenty-eight. We draw some beasts upon the slate. Four times eight is thirty-two. We break the chair and tumble through. Four times nine is thirty-six. With milk and mud our dough we mix. Four times ten is forty. I think dear John is naughty. Four times eleven is forty-four. He says he'll do it never more. Four times twelve is forty-eight. And now we think it's getting late. Five times five is twenty-five. We go with dear papa to drive. Five times six is thirty. We see our cousin Gertie. Five times seven is thirty-five. We see some bees around the hive. Five times eight is forty. We want a little more tea. Five times nine is forty-five. We teach the puppy how to dive. Five times ten is fifty. The snow is very drifty. Five times eleven is fifty-five. When we are bad, we never thrive. Five times twelve is sixty. We feel a little mixty. Six times six is thirty-six. We must not touch the candle wicks. Six times seven is forty-two. What do you think we'd better do? Six times eight is forty-eight. We'll fish and take the sponge for bait. Six times nine is fifty-four. We've caught a thousand whales and more. Six times ten is sixty. Nurse says we've made a pigsty. Six times eleven is sixty-six. We're such unlucky little chicks. Six times twelve is seventy-two. Boo-hoo, 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 boo-hoo. Seven times seven is forty-nine. Dear John, you know this doll is mine. Seven times eight is fifty-six. You might just give me half your bricks. Seven times nine is sixty-three. You're just as cross as you can be. Seven times ten is seventy. Now kiss and be forgiven, T. Seven times eleven is seventy-seven. Let's play we are the fox and raven. Seven times twelve is eighty-four. No, let's be lions. Roar, roar, roar. Eight times eight is sixty-four. Dear John now keeps a grocery store. Eight times nine are seventy-two. Dear Betty comes to buy some glue. Eight times ten is eighty. My bundle's very weighty. Eight times eleven is eighty-eight. Please pay me quick. I cannot wait. Eight times twelve is ninety-six. Make out the change and play no tricks. Nine times nine is eighty-one. A tea party will be such fun. Nine times ten is ninety. 
Dear Betty makes such fine tea. Nine times eleven is ninety-nine. Will you have beer, dear John, or wine? Nine times twelve is one hundred and eight. Our tablecloth is far from straight. Ten times ten is one hundred. Sure, one of us has blundered. Ten times eleven is one hundred and ten. We'll try to mend it up again. Ten times twelve is one hundred and twenty. Let's play we're making some frumenti. Eleven times eleven is one hundred and twenty-one. We hang our washing in the sun. Eleven times twelve is one hundred and thirty-two. Our nursey says, be quiet, do. Twelve times twelve is one hundred and forty-four. Dear John and Betty can do no more. End of the John Betty Table Section 34 of the Three Minute Stories This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christy Cruz of Wellington, Kansas. Three Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards. Section 34. The Little Gray Doves. There are many old, old stories about the dear Christ child when he was little. Not all of them are true, but all are sweet and lovely. Listen now, and you shall hear one. It had been raining in Nazareth, and the ground, which had long been parched and dry, was turned to wet clay. This was a wonderful thing for the children, and they all ran to play with the clay, just as you boys and girls do now. Some dug canals and wells, some built houses and towers, while others took the soft clay in their hands and molded it into shapes of men and animals. The little Jesus joined this last group, and while they made dogs and cats, horses and lions, he made little gray doves, and set them one by one on the edge of the fountain. Presently, sweet Mary the mother came to the door and looked out to see what the children were doing. See, cried one little boy, Mary, mother, see my dog? He can almost wag his tail and bark. Look at my lion, cried another. He is so big and strong, he can eat up your dog in a minute. Ho, said the third, my man here could whip your dog and kill your lion with his sword, and so he is the best of all. Mary Mother smiled and praised the dog, the lion, and the man. Then she said, And what has my little Jesus to show me? I have made some little gray doves, said Jesus. See, here they are. And what can they do, my little one? asked sweet Mary, as she stroked the boy's curly head. I think they can fly, said little Jesus. Fly, pretty doves. He clapped his hands, and up flew the doves like a soft gray cloud, then fluttered around the child's fair head, and lighted for a moment on his shoulders and his hands. Then they spread their gray wings and flew up into the sky, and were seen no more. End of story. Recording by Christy Cruz. The Little Gray Doves. Section 35 of Three Minute Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nanette Notestein of Nature's Magical Worlds.com. Three Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards. Merry Christmas. What is going on today, little cat? asked little dog. Everyone seems so happy and merry. I had chicken bones for breakfast 
with ever so much meat on them. I had creamed fish, said Little Cat, and it was real cream. Look, Little Girl tied a red ribbon round my neck and said I was a beauty. Am I, Little Dog? Yes, for a cat, said Little Dog. Am I? Yes, for a dog, said Little Cat. I have a new collar, you see, said Little Dog, and your girl has on a new blue dress and my boy a velvet jacket, and they are not going to say one cross word all day. I heard them tell their mother so. I was in the nursery this morning, said Little Cat. The children's stockings were full of toys and sugar plums, and they kissed each other and said, Mary something. What can it all mean? Let us ask Great Old Dog, said Little Dog. He knows almost everything, and he can surely tell us. Great Old Dog was asleep, but he woke up and heard their story patiently. It was Merry Christmas, that the children said, he told them. This is Christmas Day. What does it mean? asked Little Cat. I don't understand all about it, said Great Old Dog, but it is the best day in the whole world, for everybody is happy and kind and tries to do pleasant things for everybody else. I think someone was born who brought kindness into the world. Well, said Little Dog, if everybody is going to be good, we must be good too, Little Cat. I will not growl at you once today even if they put our dinner on the same plate. Nor I at you, said Little Cat, even if there's only one cushion by the fireside. Nice Little Cat, said Little Dog. Good Little Dog, said Little Cat. Just then in came Little Girl in her blue dress and Little Boy in his velvet jacket. Merry Christmas, they cried. Little cat and little dog and dear good great old dog, we wish you Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year, a pocket full of money and a heart full of cheer. Merry Christmas, said little dog, but it sounded like yap yap. Merry Christmas, said little cat, but it sounded like brrrr. Merry Christmas, said Great Old Dog, deep down in his great old throat, but it sounded like woof, woof, woof. End of section 35. Merry Christmas. Section 36 of Three Minute Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sonia. Three Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards. Christmas Gifts Mother, said Jack, may I have some money to buy Christmas presents with? Dear, said his mother, I have no money. We are very poor and I can hardly buy food for us all. Jack hung his head. If he had not been ten, the tears would have come to his eyes. But he was ten. All the other boys give presents, he said. So shall you, said his mother. All presents are not bought with money. The best boy that ever lived was as poor as we are, and yet he was always giving. Who was he? asked Jack. And what did he give? This is his birthday, said the mother. He was the good Jesus. He was born in a stable, and he lived in a poor working man's house. He never had a penny of his own, yet he gave twelve good gifts every day. Would you like to try his way? Yes, cried Jack. So his mother told him this and that, and soon after Jack started out, dressed in his best suit, to give his presents. First, he went to Aunt Jane's house. She was old and lame, and she did not like boys. What do you want? she asked as she opened the door. Merry Christmas, 
said Jack. May I stay for an hour and help you? Hm, said Aunt Jane. Want to keep you out of mischief, do they? Well, you may bring in some wood. Shall I split some kindling too? asked Jack. If you know how, said Aunt Jane. I can't have you cutting your foot and messing my clean shed all up. Jack found some fresh pine wood and a bright hatchet, and he split up a great pile of kindling and thought it fun. He stacked it neatly, and then he brought in a pail of water and filled the kettle. What else can I do? he asked. There are twenty minutes more. Hmm, <clears throat> said Aunt Jane. You might feed the pig. Jack fed the pig, who thanked him in his own way. Ten minutes more, he said. What shall I do now? Hm, <sighs> said Aunt Jane. You may sit down and tell me why you came. It is a Christmas present, said Jack. I am giving hours for presents. I had twelve, but I gave one to Mother, and another one was gone before I knew I had it. This hour was your present. Hm, <sighs> said Aunt Jane. She hobbled to the cupboard and took out a small round pie that smelled very good. Here she said this is your present and i thank you for mine come again will you indeed i will said jack and thank you for the pie next jack went and read for an hour to old mr green who was blind he read a book about the sea and they both liked it very much so the hour went quickly then it was time to help mother get dinner and then time to eat it that took two hours and aunt jane's pie was wonderful then Jack took the Smith baby for a ride in its carriage, as Mrs. Smith was ill, and they met its grandfather, who filled Jack's pockets with candy and popcorn, and invited him to a Christmas tree that night. Next, Jack went to see Willie Brown, who had been ill for a long time, and could not leave his bed. Willie was very glad to see him. They played a game, and then each told the other a story, and before Jack knew it, the clock struck six. "'Oh!' cried Jack. "'You have had two. Two what? asked Willie. Two hours, said Jack, and he told Willie about the presents he was giving. I am glad I gave you two, he said, and I would give you three, but I must go and help mother. Oh dear, said Willie, I thank you very much, Jack. I have had a perfectly great time, and it has driven the pain away, but I have nothing to give you. Jack laughed. Why, don't you see, he cried, you have given me just the same thing. I have had a great time, too. Mother, said Jack as he was going to bed, I have had a splendid Christmas, but I wish I had had something to give you besides the hours. My darling, said his mother, you have given me the best gift of all, yourself. End of Christmas Gifts Section 37 of Three Minute Stories this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Three Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards. Church Bells, adapted from the German of Fröbel. Air, The Bells of Abadovi. Through the window, sunbeams bright fill the church with radiant light. Now the doors wide open throng that we into church may go. Ding dong, ding dong, hark the bell. Oh, lovely things to us twill tell as we walk to church together. In the church so calm, so still, gentlest thoughts our heart must fill. Lifted high our spirit learns why with holy love it burns. Ding dong, ding dong, hark the bell. Oh, lovely things to us twill tell as we walk to church together. And we learn of him who gives light and joy to all that lives. He who stands alone and mild watches over every child. Ding dong, ding dong, 
hark the bell oh lovely things to us twill tell as we walk to church together he who made the forest fair and the flowers that blossom there gave the bird its airy wings gave the joyful song it sings ding dong ding dong hark the bell oh lovely things to us twill tell as we walk to church together and we learn of jesus mild he the pure and sinless child send that children all may know how a child in grace may grow ding dong ding dong hark the bell oh lovely things to us twill tell as we walk to church together now the organ's solemn voice joins the bell and both rejoice children join the song of love raise your hearts to heaven above ding dong ding dong hark the bell oh lovely things to us twill tell as we walk to church together End of Church Bells. Recording by Ezwa in Belgium in August 2015. Section 38 of Three Minute Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kyle Stadelhofer, Los Angeles, California. Three Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards. The Bird of Light. Adapted from the German of Froebel. A golden bird against the wall flutters and flits and does not fall. Birdie, let me hold you in my hand soft fold you no the bird flies away will not will not with me stay tis the sunshine bright dear makes the bird of light dear sunbeams gay and golden not by hands are holden tis our eyes that they delight dancing dancing glad and bright many lovely things we see cannot be touched by you or me sun moon sky two floating clouds so high two purple shadows on the grass rainbow gleams that shine and pass can you catch the lovely song the robin trills the whole day long? Can you catch my smile, dear? No. Yet all the while, dear, these are yours. And in your heart, all your life, they'll play their part. End of the Bird of Light Section 39 of Three Minute Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kyle Stadelhofer, Los Angeles, California. Three Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards. The Brothers and Sisters adapted from the German of Froebel. Five happy brothers and sisters here. They love each other so dear, so dear. The day's work over, they seek their rest and sink to sleep like the birds in their nest. Peaceful sleep, gentle sleep, mind and body strong will keep. When the golden morn doth break, Blithe and ready shall we wake. 
but before they close their eyes, hear their evening prayer arise. Praying God, their Father dear, still to watch their slumber here. Peaceful sleep, gentle sleep, not shall break thy calm so deep. He who sends thee to our eyes, watches till the day shall rise. Through the quiet starry night, through the day so long and bright, God our Father's tender care still is with us everywhere. Peaceful sleep, gentle sleep, heavenly eyes their watch do keep. Little child, so now shall you slumber, slumber softly too. End of the Brothers and Sisters Section 40 of Three Minute Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sonia. Three Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards. The Pigeons. Adapted from the German of Fröbel. Kuruk, Kuruk. The pigeons come flying flying, fluttering here and there. Welcome, welcome, let us be crying. Come, pretty pigeons, our meal to share. Have no fear, pigeons dear, corn and bread we're throwing. All for you, truly true, thus our love we're showing. Kuruk, kuruk, the pigeons are cooing. Thanks, little children, thanks to you. From the good deed that now you're doing, learn we that children are kind and true. Free from fear, see us here. Each to each we call now. Kuruk, ku, we and you. Happy are we all now. End of The Pigeons Section 41 of Three Minute Stories This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Three-Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards Pussy and Doggy Pussy White and Doggy Brown were in the yard one day. Doggy Brown thought he would like to go into the house. So he went to the door, but it was shut. He tried to open it by bumping against it, but in vain. Then he barked, but no one heard him. Then he felt very sad and sat down by the door and howled. Pussy White had been watching him with one eye while she dozed with the other. Dogs are not very clever, she said. Presently she went to the door and jumped up and lifted the latch with her paw. The door swung open. There, she said. Oh, pussy, said Doggy Brown, thank you, how clever you are. That is one way of putting it, said Pussy White, but you are welcome all the same. End of Pussy and Doggy. Recording by Eric Anderson. Section 42 of Three Minute Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Kyle Stadelhofer, Los Angeles, California. Three Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards. Dick's Family. Now this is true, for we saw it with our own eyes. Dick was a bachelor, or so we had always supposed. A large, black bachelor with bright green eyes and a very fine tail. He lived in the kitchen and managed things pretty much as he pleased. When Peter the new puppy came, he thought it would be fun to tease Dick. Dick thought it would be fun to be teased. And when he had sent Peter yelping and keeing out into the shed, 
He sat and purred and blinked his green eyes and thought the world a pleasant place. Now one day we looked out of the south parlor window and what do you think we saw? Dick was coming across the lawn looking very proud and happy. Every now and then he stopped and looked over his shoulder and mewed as if calling someone to follow him. And someone was following him. Across the lawn after him came one very thin, wretched looking tortoise shell cat, one Maltese kitten, one yellow kitten. All three looked half starved and all three were scared out of their wits. Come on, said Dick as plain as Meow could speak. They won't hurt you. These are my people. They belong to me. Come on, I tell you. They came on, though still very timidly, till they reached the barn. Then Dick took them under the barn and there made them comfortable. We did not know just how, because we cannot get under the barn. And there they stayed. And when Dick came for his supper, he said to Maggie as plain as Meow could speak, Please feed my family too. And Maggie did. That was a year ago. Now the tortoise shell cat is dead. But the Maltese kitten and the yellow kitten are large and handsome cats. And Dick still sits by the fire and purrs and blinks his large green eyes. End of Dick's Family End of Three Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards